week in a speech at the UN, El Barade appealed to Iran to make good on its commitment to remove suspicions about its nuclear program. This is a unique and fleeting opportunity to reverse course from confrontation to cooperation and should therefore not be missed. Right now though, Tehran appears to be resisting all the international pleas. So why did Iran agree to the deal in the first place? They don't want to be under pressure both externally and internally. Mohammed Sahimi is a professor at the University of Southern California and writes for the website Tehran Bureau. He notes that Iran's government has been under sharp political pressure internally since the disputed presidential election in June spawned an enormous and very determined opposition movement. At the same time, the international pressure over its nuclear program was threatening to bring about more economic sanctions. Dealing with both challenges simultaneously may be too much for Iran's embattled leaders. To make matters worse for Iran's government, it faces a technical problem it may not be able to overcome on its own. Although Iran does have a considerable amount of low enriched uranium, Mohammed Sahimi points out it does not have the capability to turn it into fuel rods for the Tehran research reactor. Iran is not known to have any technology right now available in Iran that can produce a fuel rod. So Iran can delay or stall all at once, but that simply gets it closer to the day when it will run out of the capacity to produce medical isotopes. This may be why Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in Berlin earlier this week seemed so patient with Iran. We believe that this uh, offer represents an important opportunity for Iran, both to meet the medical and humanitarian needs that the Tehran Research Reactor uh, fulfills, and to begin to restore international confidence in their nuclear program. The US, Europe, and Russia all appear to be willing to wait a little while longer, which may not be a weakness in this case, because, says Abbas Malani, the degree of confusion and disarray among Iran's leaders is unprecedented. They used to be much better at all of this. They used to be able to play this game, I think, much better. If you look at their behavior in the last uh, two months, it's just bizarre. If the Iranians don't end the stall, they may find themselves facing both harsher treatment internationally and without the medical isotopes they need. Mike Schuster, NPR News. And to mark today, Veterans Day, Senate Democrats had hoped to pass legislation helping caregivers of disabled American veterans from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But efforts this week to consider that bill ran into the implacable opposition of one Republican senator, Oklahoma's Tom Coburn. Here's NPR's David Wilma. Ed Edmondson was on Capitol Hill yesterday with his son, Eric Edmondson, an Army specialist who was left a quadriplegic from an IED attack in Iraq four years ago. The father said he and his wife have struggled to care for their son news conference, he urged the Senate to pass legislation providing home caregivers like himself a stipend, health insurance, counseling, and a two-week annual break. I urge you, I ask you, I beg you to get the caregiver bill passed. But there's no money to pay for the bill, which is why Oklahoma Republican Tom Coburn put a hold on it. I sent a letter to every senator at the beginning of this Congress that if you put a bill on the floor and you're going to authorize new spending, you better be putting something with it that's going to decrease the spending you pay for that. And so therefore, that's the reason for the home. Coburn, who's also a physician, insists he too thinks the nation should keep its commitment to veterans. And I think many of the programs that are in this bill are ideally suited for the problems that our veterans have. What I object to is the fact that we're going to create $3.7 billion worth of spending over the next five years and not make any effort whatsoever to eliminate programs that don't have anywhere near the priority that this program does. Coburn also questions why caregivers of Vietnam and Gulf War veterans are not included. Dick Durbin, the Senate's number two Democrat, is the bill's sponsor. He points out that Coburn is the only senator blocking the bill. Because of his objection, 6,000 800 veterans of those served in Iraq and Afghanistan are unable to get this additional care. I know we can't give it to every caregiver. I know it will be limited, and we'll have to make that decision as part of our deliberation as to what we can do. But to say that we should do nothing for these people is to make a mockery of this Veterans Day. And Majority Leader Harry Reid notes that Coburn did not block bills funding the Iraq War that weren't paid for. I have no ability comprehend the logic of Dr. Coburn. A vote on breaking Coburn's hold on the bill is expected next week. David Bona, NPR News, the Capitol. And throughout this Veterans Day,
Today we are listening to the voices of veterans about their experiences coming home from war. NPR's Habiba Nasheen has this story of a soldier's return from Vietnam. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Michael Sternfeld. I'm 62 years old. I'm retired from the U.S. Army. Michael Sternfeld is an Amtrak conductor at Washington's Union Station. What many of his passengers don't know is that he served as a sergeant in Vietnam. When I came home, when we landed, and there was this cheer went up inside the plane when the wheels touched down in California. Back on home turf, Sternfeld was handed his discharge papers and given a flu shot. Right after, he headed to the airport. They were anti-Vietnam protesters and they couldn't separate the soldier from the war. Little did they realize, probably two-thirds of the people going by in uniform were just as disgusted with the war as they were. My main thrust was to get on the plane and head toward Omaha. I wanted to get back to his college. When we came down that old TWA 707, I had one thought of the guys who I had seen killed and of Steve who took his own life. And I said, wow, I'm here. It's time to move on and take advantage of this. Just, oh, what a gift I've been given. That's the best way I can put it. The gift to move on and do something with the rest of your life. Years later, Sternfeld fought as an Army reservist in the Gulf War, and in 2005, he was back with the Army in Iraq, where he injured his leg. Sternfeld's Army training has come in handy in his job with Amtrak. He says, thanks to his military background, his daily trains from Washington to New York always came on time. Habiba Nasheen, NPR News, Washington. Good morning, it's 6.49, I'm Cherry Glazer, and you're listening to Morning Edition on 89.9 KCRW. KCRW sponsors include Fox Searchlight Pictures, presenting Fantastic Mr. Fox, the new animated comedy from director Wes Anderson, featuring George Clooney and Meryl Streep, based on the classic novel by Roald Dahl, in select theaters this Friday. Still to come, a memorial service was held at Fort Hood yesterday to honor the men and women who died in last week's shooting rampage there. The service included prayer, music, and words of encouragement to those who must continue to serve at the post. Support comes from UCSB Arts and Lectures, presenting London's Deviate Physical Theater, a leader in contemporary dance. Taking physical and aesthetic risks, this highly political dance theater piece features documentary, animation, and film. Deviate performs at the Lobero Theater in Santa Barbara, November 18th through 20th. For tickets, call 805-893-3535 or visit artsandlectures.ucsb.edu. I'm Elvis Mitchell. Next time on the treatment, the lives of families with autistic children are exhausting, harrowing, and finally made even hopeful. The family of Rupert Isaacson is featured in the new documentary, The Horse Boy, next time on the treatment. Today at 2.30 on 89.9 KCRW. KCRW sponsors include Bank of America, which has begun a 10-year, $1.5 trillion investment in low to moderate income and minority communities. Well, it's going to be partly cloudy today with highs near 70 at the beach, 80s inland. 64 degrees right now in downtown Los Angeles, 44 in Lancaster. Support from the <coughs> Net app, providing storage <coughs>
some really good news there. Despite the uh, uh, down numbers in the Shanghai instant index, uh, Chinese shares were uh, lower, even though they had some uh, good production news that came out today. Chinese industrial production shot up about 16%. The government yesterday lost the first criminal case it brought in response to the financial crisis. A couple of Bear Stearns hedge fund managers were acquitted on charges of lying to investors. Let's bring in Marketplace's Nancy Marshall Ganter, who's with us live from our Washington bureau this morning. Hi, Nancy. Good morning. So what went wrong for prosecutors? You know, the prosecutors relied to a great extent on emails between the two former hedge fund managers, Ralph Chaffee and Matthew Tannen. In one email, Tannen quotes a report saying, if it's correct, the entire subprime market is toast. But jurors were quoted as saying prosecutors took snippets of email and used them out of context. Uh, I talked to James Kaufman about this. He's a former assistant director of enforcement at the SEC, and he told me the prosecutors might have needed more solid evidence than emails. There was sufficient ambiguity, apparently, in the evidence to allow the jury to, to acquit these people. Will, will the Bear Stearns case, Nancy, uh, make prosecutors more reluctant to bring future cases, or will it change their strategy? Not according to Kaufman. Um, he doesn't think this will make prosecutors change anything. He doesn't see this as a bellwether case. He does say other cases, like the insider trading case involving the Galleon Group, may be stronger. That case uh, alleges there was an insider trading ring that included the Galleon Group hedge fund. And prosecutors in that case have wiretap evidence, and some people have already pleaded guilty. Prosecutors use sort of FBI tactics in that uh, case, actually trailing people and and getting wiretaps. All right, Marketplace is Nancy Marshall Genser joining us from Washington. Nancy, thanks. You're welcome. Richard DeCaser is president of Woodley Park Research. He's also in Washington with us live on the radio with us. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. We just heard from our reporter, Nancy, that the U.S. government couldn't seal the deal in its case against those hedge fund managers. And today, of course, we continue to hear from the Senate Banking Committee and its chair, Chris Dodd, about reforming financial regulations. So, so Senator Dodd seems to be focused a lot on the Federal Reserve and cuts back on the Fed's power. Good idea or bad idea, Richard? I think part of it's a good idea. For example, they want to take all these various regulators we've got at the Comptroller of the Currency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Fed, and the FDIC, and put them in one place, and that's going to discourage the kind of picking and choosing that banks can now do, and arguably uh, creates uh, incentives for the regulators themselves to maybe kowtow too much to their regulated see how that moves forward. I, I'm curious this morning, Richard, this week we've had report after report of job cuts. Adobe, 680 layoffs. Sprint, 2,500 jobs gone. Pfizer, 2,000 jobs. Um, if this is what recovery looks like, I mean, send it away. I mean, what's going on? Well, you have to be careful to distinguish between announcements and actual layoffs. And uh, uh, while we've seen a lot of high-profile layoffs announced, the count of those things, for example, Challenger, Gray, uh, company based in Chicago actually tallies these up. It's been declining all year long. And actual layoffs, which we get a read on every Thursday, have also been moving down. So it's not uncommon to keep costs under control, especially at the stage of the recovery where growth is still very modest overall. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't confuse those high profile announcements with the reality, mm -hmm. which is declining layoffs over time. Richard Kayser in Washington. Richard, thanks. A pleasure. This morning report is supported by SunGuard. SunGuard Availability Services operates 5 million square feet of secure data center space dedicated to keeping people and information connected. More information at SunGuard.com. And by Thomson Reuters, a source of intelligent information to businesses and professionals around the world. Thomson Reuters, knowledge to act. You know what they say about the difference between men and women who are lost? The woman will ask for directions while the guy will just try and find his way on his own. Well, according to a report out this morning, that may apply to investment decisions as well, as Marketplace of Jeremy Hobson reports. In a survey, the online brokerage Scott Trade asked women and men the same question. Did your investment portfolio hold the same value or increase over the past year? Scott Trade's Chris Maloney says yes was the answer for 48% of each gender. So their performance is basically the same. However, when you ask women about their level of confidence or their overall confidence in their abilities to do their own investing, they rank themselves a lot lower. And he says
says the survey found women are more likely to seek financial education before investing. Marian Asnes at Financial Planning Magazine has studied women's money management. She says today's report should make women feel better about investing. Those women who had been sneered at as being risk averse and passive and blah, 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 turned out to do pretty darn well simply because they made well-considered decisions and stuck with them. The study also found more women than men are using their investments to save for a family member's education or for a rainy day. In New York, I'm Jeremy Hobson for Marketplace. And finally, being Santa Claus means you have to know the lingo. These days, kids are wanting PSPs or DVDs or Nintendo DSIs. In Britain, PC World is helping out. About 30 Kris Kringles have taken the magazine up on free training so they can deepen their knowledge of all the technical choices. One Santa Claus told The Telegraph he remembers the days of Connect Four when simple games were the rule. We here in the States remember this one.
International and Afghan forces began a surge, but this ran into trouble when they got caught up in fighting with militants. Seven Afghan soldiers and policemen and one civilian died. Afghanistan's defense ministry has said they were killed by mistake by a NATO airstrike. NATO says it's investigating, but agrees NPR News Kabul. President Obama holds a White House meeting today with his national security team. They plan to discuss Afghanistan and options for U.S. strategy in that country. Three months ago,